Good evening, everyone. Sorry about that crash. This is about AG part two. Let's go ahead and finish up with the bullion dealer data before we get into the meat and potatoes of the numbers from about AG. So the upshot of this is that I remember back in 2008 when the Bear Stearns crisis happened and Jason Hummel sent out a letter warning people that there were bullion shortages occurring. He had also warned that people need to be very careful about taking delivery from places that take a very, very long time to deliver. Now, that's not an important thing right now, but it may be going forward. And that's because, one, some of these entities could become insolvent. Now, About AG did the best coverage of the tolving situation. And if you're one of the people who is expecting delivery and hasn't gotten delivery and the place that you're dealing with goes bankrupt, you become a creditor. That is not a situation you want to be in. So the shorter the delivery time that you have, the better. Now, it's going to be something that we're going to have to watch out for in the future. It's not something that's important right now. But my recommendation is the same that Jason made, that if you buy over time, now you do have to pay shipping fees. Usually I pay about 10 bucks or something like that. Sometimes it's free. But if you stack your silver over time, even if you do actually become involved with some type of bankruptcy or a situation where they don't ship, it's only going to be a small percentage of what you're stacking that you're going to lose become a creditor for and get caught up in all kinds of paper nonsense. So this, I believe, is going to be much more important going forward. And of course, there's all of the other things, factors that we want to look at. Now, let's go ahead and dig into the meat and potatoes of the numbers here on about AG. There's some important things I'm going to go over. One is the SLV analysis. And then the most important is going to be the daily silver data. So let's start with the SLV analysis. This is actually, if you remember way back, there were a series of videos that came out where someone was doing a breakdown of the bar list and one was on a PDF and there were a number of discrepancies found. It's very difficult to assess the truth of any of this. I tend to lean on the side that a lot of this stuff is fake. I can't prove it we don't get to see tours of as jason hommel pointed out there's no reason why somebody can't take a video camera and film the stacks of bars but we're never going to see that i've covered the players that are involved whether it's jp morgan or whether it's um one of the new york banks or whether it's barclays all the people involved they're all the big banks and they're not going to give you a tour of the vault but be that as it may if we look here the first thing I want to start pointing out here with the SLV, I can't verify the authenticity of these bars added or subtracted, so I'm not even going to bother. I'm just going to look at this current number here, and this is the number of ounces in the SLV. So the thing I want you to note here when we look at this is, and this goes back to about, let's see, we've got 2010. Now, the SLV actually started in, I believe it was 2006. We'll see when we get to the SLV volume. But this series of numbers starts in 2010. And you can see this figure is going to be steadily all the way across the board here. It's about 300 million ounces. Now, that's, I'm assuming, roughly what they started out with, but I could be wrong. I, I believe some have reported that it was the Buffett silver by the roughly 115 million ounces, I believe, that started. So, But what we have here in these numbers is this, this figure of around 300 million. Now, you can see it creeps up to about 350 million. That's in November 2010. And you know that we had the big smackdown in 2011 it's still hovering about that 350 number 358 361 we get in april of 2011 that's going to be 
probably the top. Here's 363, but this was canceled. 366 comes in here, and then we get May. We're down to 350, then 340. This was the big top, but you could see it falls to about that 300 level, and then it levels off again about 300, starting to climb into the 320s, averaging 300 all the way up to the present, and you can see 3 to 350, and that's the number of ounces in the SLV. Right there today, 350. So pretty much the same number we've always had. Now why is that important? Well, I think it's important because I just don't really trust the numbers. And if we look at SLV historical prices, what I did was I went to the SLV and pulled the monthly data. Now, you could break it down and go through it by day. I didn't want to do that. The big standout here, and I've covered this before, are these months here. The months of April 2011 and May of 2011. So you can see when you add those two months together, we're talking about 200 million volume in the turnover on the SLV. Averaging a monthly volume many months of seven or eight, and then coming up to 15 times that. You can see how it drops back down, and even up to the current date, we're looking at five to 10 million. So what happened at that time? Well, it's my contention that there was just a gigantic smackdown in paper silver. And I think the evidence of that is the fact that the volume in the SLV went up 15 fold for these two months, but the number of bars in the SLV really didn't change at all. So how much of its paper I suspect that maybe 99% of the SLV is paper. So now let's get over to the much more important figures here about the U.S. Silver Eagle. Now I'm going to read this web page that they have here about Silver Eagle and the sourcing of Silver Eagles from the United States mines and just to clarify that. Many people believe that they have heard that the U.S. Mint is required by law to purchase silver mine in the United States to create American silver eagles. This is only partially true. The original law, when American silver eagles were first introduced in 1986, the law stated that the silver for the American eagles must come from the U.S. strategic and critical materials stockpile. At that time, the Mint could only buy silver for eagles from the government stockpile for other silver coins, but not the eagles, it could purchase newly mined silver from American refiners. However, in the early 2000s, the stockpile was quickly depleting. If it was allowed to be used up, no more silver American eagles could be mined. So the law changed in 2002, such that once the stockpile was depleted, the mint was required to buy silver from natural deposits in the United States that were brought to the U.S. Mint within a year after being mined, as had been allowed for other silver coins. However, the law also provided an out. If it is not economically feasible to obtain silver from U.S. mines. That's going to be the key point here. Not economically feasible. The Mint could obtain the silver from other sources, available sources. That gave the Mint the ability to buy foreign silver in cases where the American silver was not available or could be only obtained above the spot price as it states that the Mint cannot pay more than the average world price, essentially the COMEX spot price. The requirement to use American silver silver only applied to newly mined silver within one year of being mined to help support American silver mines. Really? To help support American silver mines? The way you help support American silver mines is you don't ration silver. You let the price rise and you don't let the comics control the price. That's ridiculous. So the law treated old silver mine in the United States the same as foreign silver. At any point where obtaining the recently mined U.S. silver was not economically feasible, e.g. it would cost more than the spot or not be available quickly as needed, the Mint could use any other silver they could find. So let's jump over to the data and keep that in mind about the availability of the silver. 
Now this is a very interesting page. This is statistics about silver that change every day. And you can see here, it is updated 12-5-2014. Uh, so that's the absolute latest. And there's some very interesting data here. So the first one we want to look at here is going to be the backwardation. You can see that silver is in backwardation. I've discussed backwardation before. Um, basically, to summarize it, to make it really, really simple, the concept is simply this. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. That's what it means. That, that silver that is available right now is selling at a premium to silver that is available in the future. Now, the normal, normal situation for futures markets is that the silver will be at a premium in the future. And you can see that was the case for a very long time, back to the May of 2011. You can see during that time frame, we had a buck 30, a buck, uh, that was the forward price of silver. And then in about, we're still positive here at about 30 cents, and about January 2013, you can see we went negative. Went negative about 30 cents, started going all the way up and hit about a dollar negative on the summer of 2013. And then we hit highs of nearly a buck 50. It came back down and we're now we're hovering around that dollar price. Uh, you can see it actually went all the way up to a dollar 90. That was in the summer of this year and uh, back down to $1.15, you, you can see we're hovering at about a buck. So that's very important that investors in silver would rather have their silver now than wait and take the risk that they won't get their silver in the future. Anytime you have backwardization, uh, backwardization that's a serious situation in the metals markets. Now, another very important column here is going to be the COMEX silver deliveries. You can see these obviously have to be in ounces because you can see here for the 28th of November, you've got 8 million, is the figure, 8 million ounces in one day. That's phenomenal. Next day, 2 million. And so uh, that's a very large amount. You remember the number I've always talked about, 50 million. 50 million is the amount that's mined in the U.S. And here's a fifth of it in two days. That's the number of silver eagles in a year as well. So that's pretty big deliveries on the COMEX. If we go and look historically, there are some places where it's rivaled uh, some of these 1 and 2 million, but nothing like the current amount that we're seeing. Now, I'm not going to go into the open interest and the total open interest and the next open interest. Uh, here's the ounces in the SLV, the registered and the eligible. I'm not going to pay any attention to that. But I want you to focus in on these US mint sales. This is very important. Now we know that the mint reported that when the price of silver started dropping around that 16 and 15 handle, they were overwhelmed with physical purchase orders for the Silver Eagles. And you can see the mint sales coming in here of uh, now, I'm, I'm not going to take note of this the last three digits because we are going to guess that we're getting these uh, monster boxes. And those are in a quantity of 500 ounces. So that makes sense. This number is always going to be three zeros or a 500. That makes sense to me. But let me show you some things that don't make sense to me. Um, th it makes sense that these come in here at 3 million, 3 million, 3 million, 3 million, 2 million, and pretty much the mint was wiped out. Now you can see for December, we're down to 662,500. Now the numbers that don't make sense are the fact that the exact same number, 66 to 500, 66 to 500, this comes in four days in a row. Now that is an allocation. That is a shortage. There's really no difference between those two terms if the mint says, okay, you're this de primary dealer, these are the ones, uh, Amark and the others that sell to the Gainesvilles and the Atmex and the province of the world, they go to the mint and order the number of monster boxes that they want, that they think they're going to end up selling. 
and uh, that's based upon the business that they see or have had orders coming in, well, they've been told that they have an allotment. So they're only going to get a certain percentage of what they want. It's very clear by these numbers that this is an allotment. There is no way by random chance, in fact, I would probably estimate, uh, not being the greatest probability and statistics person, but I would estimate that the odds of the number of silver eagles being ordered by these primary dealers for four days in a row being the exact same number down to the ounce is probably one in whatever quadrillion. So this is obviously an allocation going on here. Now you can see that when the silver spiked up here, it uh, came in, in in different numbers. But what's very odd is that we see an allocation here from November 14th all the way back to November 5th. This is also an allocation. Now what I think you're going to find to be absolutely shocking here and I'm just going to take these numbers on face value. The most shocking thing about this silver data is that these allocation numbers go all the way back. So let's go all the way back and look at this series and you'll see what I'm talking about here. You can see here that in 2011, here we go. Here's March. 27670000. Four days in a row. That's an allocation. 1417000. One, four days in a row. This is in March of 2011. Okay, here's April. 2010. Uh, 2101. 2101, 2101, three days in a row, four days in a row, the exact same amount. This is right before the SmackDown. Interesting, data dries up right there on the silver top. Here it comes again, 1421000. And we can just scroll up and look at this series. Here's the July 19th of 2011. This is after the price had crashed. 19,69,500, one, two, three, four days in a row. And if you follow this, you'll see it goes on all the way through this series. Now, the only explanation I can come up with is that silver eagles have always been in a shortage. They've always been in an allocation. It means that they have been rationing silver the entire time that the series has run. Now, you know that I follow the Perth Mint, and let's go ahead and look at Provident Metals because I believe that the Perth Mint actually allocates or rations theirs as well. I think it's a much more complex process, but nevertheless, I think that they ration theirs. So I just wanted to take you to one buy here that I just want to cover because I, I don't have a lot of dry powder now, but this is one that really surprised me. I go through four and five different sites every day and check my favorite coins based on price, based on what I think is a deal. And uh, just for the members, I'm going to tell you, this is one that I'm eyeing. Now we picked up quite a few of the half ounce horse series. We picked the cheapest ones up around 12 some others we got a little bit higher than that now currently the horses are going half ounce horses you cannot find them anywhere for less than 16 bucks now these are colorized horses I have never purchased a colorized coin in my life but I'm actually considering these um, if we talk about how many they have I think they have a lot and uh, I think it was 1800 You can see here, I got a price of 1397 for those. So I'm not buying them right now, but I'm considering it. Uh, I just don't see how you can lose if the price... I don't see how the price of a colorized coin could be less than the real thing. I guess it makes sense, but to me, this seems to be a great deal. And again, it... The proof seems to be in those numbers. They have been rationing or allocating Silver Eagles for the entire time. I think the Perth has been for the entire time. I think all of them have been for the entire time. And the reason is, of course, th there isn't that much silver out there. And they want to let go of as little as possible.
and we'll talk to you next time.